HearThis.com. Welcome to Boot Rap, the voice of the Bootstrap Network. The Bootstrap Network serves entrepreneurs around the globe. Learn more by visiting bootstrapnetwork.com. If you can find some way to make your passion your profession, then that's really when you end up winning. You'll find this podcast and many others at hearthis.com and on iTunes. Search for Boot Rap, B-O-O-T-R-A-P. Elliot is this uh, incredible guy. But we we had this we got we got caught up uh, on a conversation. I think we spoke for like two hours or something. And um, he what he does is he, he he teaches a course and he's written a book that combines um, the, entrep- the entrepreneurial journey, the artistic journey as as, as entrepreneurs as a heroic journey. So uh, if you go to his website art, artsentrepreneurship.com, you'll see like how they've mapped all the stages to to that. Um, so we talk about how that maps to the stages we talk about at Bootstrap, which is ideation, valley of death, and growth. And there's a, almost a perfect mapping to you know, the, the call, the, the world of trials, and then kind of the return. So, so it works really well. So, Elliot, uh, why don't you, uh, you know, take it away and just tell us, uh, tell us about what you do and, and about your perspective on that, and then we'll bombard you with questions and uh, kind of go from there. Oh, sure. Thanks so much. Yeah, basically, I just got an opportunity to teach this class for the first time last January, and I'd always wanted to teach a business class that was geared more towards artists and creative types, and people never quite made it over to the MBA school, and also people at the MBA school never quite reached out to. So a natural fit, uh, when you're bringing in all these nebulous topics such as business, law, art, technology, uh, a cohesive way to bring it all together was the hero's journey. So that kind of became the syllabus of the class. And then it's kind of uh, become the table of contents of a book I'm working on. And you might be familiar with Christopher Vogler's The Writer's Journey, which he based on Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And it started out as a memo in Hollywood, I think about 10, 15 years ago. But it has become a book. So I went a little bit more towards that structure of The Hero's Journey. It's a little bit more contemporary, and he brings in a lot more contemporary movies. So next semester, I am requiring uh, Joseph Campbell's original Hero with a Thousand Faces book, just because I kept going back to it so much. But anyways, I can go over uh, the 12 stages real quick and then just show some real brief outlines, because we basically, in doing the Hero's Journey, we follow kind of four parallel paths. And one is uh, contemporary movies, such as Lord of the Rings and The Matrix and Star Wars. And then the actual Hero's Journey, the actual writings of Joseph Campbell, and then also uh, classic books, such as The Odyssey, uh, going way back to then. I mean, there's the Hero's Journey. And then uh, going to uh, actual entrepreneurs, such as Branson and Stephen Jobs and Donald Trump, of course, was in the belly of the whale facing bankruptcy. In fact, he still might be bankrupt, right? I'm, I'm never quite sure about where he is with that. And then uh, finally... Uh, everybody else is on their own hero's journey in the entire class. So they have to fill out like what their called adventure is and what their ordinary world is and why they might refuse the call. So without further ado, I'll jump... Anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'll just jump into the 12 stages and how they kind of map to those five parallel tracks. So uh, it starts off with the ordinary world, and that could be you coming up with just an idea for some kind of cool invention uh, one day. Or so often entrepreneurs just solve a small problem for themselves, and then they realize, wait, if this works for me, then it can work for a lot of other people. A case in point is uh, Sarah Blakely invented the Spanx foot with pantyhose. One night she just cut the feet off of pantyhose because uh, she like needed to wear them with open-toed shoes or something. She decided to get a patent on it, uh, and six months later, I think, Oprah bought a pair in Saks Avenue who'd picked it up. And Oprah had her on, and now she has, like, 30 employees. And she was actually second on Richard Branson's uh, Rebel Billionaire show. But anyway, she was just solving a problem for herself. But then she believed in it, took out 5000 started the whole thing. So that's, like, the whole call to adventure. Uh, and another person I'll talk about is John Bogle, the guy who founded uh, Vanguard. And 1951 at Princeton University, he was reading Fortune magazine, 
and he came across an article that said you can't predict the stock market. And the people who tried never did better than the market as an average. So he conceived of what we know today as the index fund, which is very commonly uh, a common investment, just buying the top 500 of the S&P, which is what Vanguard became. But anyways, everyone told him it was a dumb idea, so he stayed in the ordinary world for 20 years working on Wall Street. So he got laid off in the 70s, and then he had a final, finally had a chance to put it into action, which is very parallel to Neo working at a cubicle, and he receives a phone call, and he's told there's two ways to leave the building. One is like in the custody of the agents, and the other is to like jump out on the ledge and onto like where the painters are painting. And he chooses, he doesn't want to jump at that point. So that's the whole idea of the, you have the call to adventure, and then the refusal of the call. So oftentimes it's this little thing that makes sense to you, and it's something that's itching, but then, you know, you, and plus you hear it from your parents, you hear it from everybody else, it's a lot safer to work for 401k and Social Security, which is kind of a little bit like, wait, is that really safer these days? So uh, students in, in studying John Bogle's life, he took 20 years before he finally went and did it. Uh, also the guy who wrote Braveheart, Randall Wallace, is interesting because he was working for TV, and uh, the people in TV told him, he told his boss that, wait, we could do a lot better than this. And he said he drove German cars and had a nice house in the Hollywood Hills and his kids were going to private schools, and he ends up getting fired because he kept on trying to do better stuff, and his boss told him that. So he basically could not get a job in TV whatsoever, so he had to write a screenplay. And so he ended up writing Braveheart. And the exact same exchange that basically happened between him and his boss, uh, which he told his boss that we, we're here to serve the people. I mean, we're not here to just make stupid stuff and get revenue from people watching it, but we're actually here to do art. And in the movie Braveheart, William Wallace tells the nobles, he says, that's the difference. I believe that we're here to give the people freedom. You think that they're here to give you position. And two, it's the exact same moral premise at the heart of Vanguard. Because what John Bogle was saying was, wait, Wall Street doesn't exist to profit off of everybody's hard work, but Wall Street, the proper stewardship of people's funds is to maximize the profit of the investors. Because after all, it is the investors, it are the investors who are putting all the risk up. Uh, so it's not the mutual fund's job to take all the profits, but to share it in the maximum way, which would be an index fund. So it's kind of cool, all those parallel. And I mean, you can see the exact same thing uh, in Star Wars Lord of the Rings. I mean, the whole idea of serving and being served. Uh, then there's that whole point uh, of calling the bluff. This is kind of one little thing that I inserted into the hero's journey, where after the call to adventure, call to adventure and refusal of the call, at some point, there comes that point where you have to call the bluff. And today it's kind of like easy when you talk about the 401k, you talk about Social Security, you talk about the dollar and how it's been taken off the gold standard, and uh, I mean how it's falling and how real estate is kind of a bubble. So it's up to you. Uh, is it really safer to go work a nine to five job that might or might not be there in like a couple of years, or to actually follow your dreams and follow your bliss? And Joseph Campbell always said, if you follow your bliss, you always have your bliss. But if you go after money, sometimes you don't get either. Uh, then the fifth step: crossing the first threshold. And that, that's often the point of no return, depending on your business. The great thing about the electronic age, the digital age, is that it doesn't cost that much to register a domain and set up a website. So the threshold is a very small threshold. Uh, some of my friends are in the restaurant business, and that's a big threshold, because you take out a few million dollars in loans to buy all the equipment for your restaurant, and you sign everything against it, uh, all your possessions and house and everything, to the bank. So that's really crossing the threshold, because the second you hire like 10 employees, or if you are writing a bigger venture, you take a lot, a lot of credit card debt. But I always encourage my students to start really small and uh, try to start with, make sure that you have the right idea before you cross that point of no return. Because uh, the hero's journey, I mean, it doesn't always turn out uh, as you'd expect. But the good thing about viewing it is you can view it as many small ones because that's another thing. It, puts, it contextualizes the whole idea of failure because... Uh, through it in every single movie, uh, I mean, Neo, throughout the Matrix, questions himself time and time again. He never quite believes that he's the one. And then, in addition, the Oracle tells him that he's not the one. And yet, still, at the end, uh, he chooses to sacrifice himself. So it's kind of that whole idea that only you, at the end of the day, can tell you yourself if you're good enough. And you have to discount all the previous failures and uh, just move forward. In the classical mythology story, uh, all of the heroes, time and time, 
time and again fail or come close to failing. Lord of the Rings is so artfully done because, of course, uh, little Frodo gets the ring to Mordor at the very end, and they decide to put it on. So he went this whole journey. It's the nine hours of the film or ten hours of the film, the three volumes, thousands of pages. At the very end, he defeats the whole purpose of going the whole way because he decides to keep the ring. And it's only because Gollum bites his uh, finger off and falls into the pit, taking it with him, that it ever works. So it's the whole idea that even the greatest heroes are fallible. Uh, and then step six is meeting the mentor. And I always encourage the students that mentors surround them in the forms of the great books and classics. I was reading uh, Closing the American Mind the other day, and Alan Bloom was lamenting that people don't look at books as companions anymore. And that's just so true, because uh, they really are. I mean, there's so much mentorship in all the great books and classics. I mean, just reading the Odyssey. The Odyssey basically is a story about long-term investing and making it on home and putting off the short tem- short-term temptations such as uh, the sirens and the lotus eaters uh, to make it on home. And the very opening lines, Odysseus is the only one who's returned, and he tried to tell his men uh, to like go the right way, but they never listened and they didn't make it. Uh, but just starting with that, across all time and all cultures, there's such a vast wealth of mentorship. That's a great thing about Joseph Campbell is that he looked across all time and all cultures and found all of the classical parallels in all the mythologies. So uh, to him, because before him, in a sense, a lot of different religions were based more on exclusivity, like we're the only ones with the right answer. But what he kind of saw is, he kind of said, well, wait, we're all in this together, and look, this is really the same thing as that, and this is a complete parallel to that. So basically, uh, at the meeting in the mentor stage, I, I won't read through them all here, but uh, just I encourage my students to read Joseph Campbell's works and use that as a doorway to go back to a lot of the great books and classics, as well as contemporaries, such as The Warren Buffett Way and uh, the, the book written by John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, uh, which kind of, they, they both emphasize long-term investing. And I, I've always thought the long-term investing is very much the entrepreneurial standpoint because it's often the entrepreneur that forgoes the short-term profits, forgoes the salary in terms of a much longer goal and dream. Where so much of Wall Street, and even that spills over to the venture capital world, is more concerned with like the cashing out and the money, which is somewhat divorced from the fundamentals of the business. And that's Warren Buffett. I mean, Warren Buffett is very much a business investor. And that's where you get actually get the huge returns from uh, understanding an underlying business and seeing an, an actual physical, visceral opportunity. Otherwise, you get uh, not, but not such big returns. Uh, and so anyways, and then going to the classics, uh, looking at Shakespeare, the Odyssey, then Inferno, and biography, reading Benjamin Franklin, Richard Branson, and Stephen Jobs. Uh, both his authorized and unauthorized biographies. And then also web resources abound. Uh, step seven is test allies and enemies. And uh, there's a good Shakespeare passage about uh, be thou familiar but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new unhatched, new hatched, unfledged comrade. It's just talking about how few and far between real friends can be. And be careful about signing uh, contracts and who you work with and the people you surround you with. Uh, so that that's a fun thing. Cause, uh, and, of course, if you look at The Matrix again or if you look at uh, Lord of the Rings, because uh, everybody wants to get their hand on that ring the whole way through. So who can you trust and who can't you trust? Even Golem, the person uh, who leads them across the whole way, there's that whole constant question is, should we be trusting this person or not? And in the Matrix, there is a cipher, the traitor, who uh, totally turned on everybody. And uh, Joseph Campbell has the archetypes. I mean, that would be like the shapeshifter. So that whole idea of the road of trials, tests, allies, and enemies is very much a part of an entrepreneur's life. If you read Branson's biography or Stephen Jobs, I mean, Stephen Jobs was kicked out of his own company after he brought uh, some MBAs in. Of course, he was brought back and led it to new heights, which is another parallel I'll talk about later. Then there's uh, step eight, which is the belly of the whale, uh, Joseph Conrad called it. I'm mean, not Joseph Conrad, Joseph Campbell. And the inmost case. If you think about it, both Donald Trump and Richard Branson both faced bankruptcy. Uh, Stephen Jobs was fired from Apple. And William Wallace was betrayed by the Scottish nobles 
and Robert the Bruce on the battlefield, and Neo told by the Oracle that he wasn't the one. And yet all of them uh, fought back and triumphed. And so it is in, like, real life uh, when we... Uh, so much of school teaches us that to get an F is bad and you can never recover from that. I mean, everything is done, like, on a good or bad or fail or not fail. Rather than seeing that if you're living by ideals or if you're living with a dream, failure is a natural part of everything, just the way that the world is made up. But to always keep that faith. And failure isn't necessarily a bad thing, because if John Bogle hadn't had this idea for Vanguard and been fired, he never would have made Vanguard. If uh, Randall Wallace had never told his boss, saying, hey, wait, we can do a lot better, he would have never been fired. He would have never would have written Braveheart. Uh, so it's that whole idea which comes from classical literature, and it's it is totally infused the Matrix, because everybody does this in the Matrix practically. The whole idea to lose your life is to find it. And to kind of that whole idea of risk everything, uh, which is where risk comes from. That's another thing we talk about, because Wall Street is always the place where they talk about risk, like Wall Street is where they get the risk and the reward and they take risks. But that's all is kind of, and Mark Cuban has a lot on this, so that's a little bit more salesmanship. Because the last thing Wall Street about is risk, because they basically make the bulk of their commissions to the tune of tens of billions of dollars on commissions, which aren't any risk whatsoever. Because the zero-sum transactions, someone buys the stock, someone sells the exact same price, and they take a commission. And that's where it comes from, like the churn. The real risk takers, uh, naturally, are always the actual people working in the garages. And plus, Wall Street, when they're taking risks, they're risking other people's money. Uh, so how much of a huge risk is that? It's, I've always, and that's what I've come back to time and time again in class, that it's, I mean, it's a lone individual risking their time uh, that is actually the, the true risk taker. Then there's step number eight, seizing the sword. Uh, and this is a classical... Uh, thing that occurs in King Arthur's court. There's only one, the sword and the stone, the famous legend, there's only one person who can seize the sword. Exact same thing with uh, Luke Skywalker being the only one who could defeat Darth Vader, the only one who could actually shoot uh, that final uh, blast into the Death Star. How Neo, Neo is actually an anagram for one, and he's the only one who can uh, defeat the Matrix. Just as Frodo, it's not always, and oftentimes, uh, we often confuse heroes with, like, the bold and the loud. But in all these movies and in classical literature, it's often the hero that is the most humble. And it's actually Frodo's inner strength that allows him to complete the journey because he's the only one who can carry the ring the whole journey without actually putting it on. Everybody else knows that they can. Uh, but the whole idea that the entrepreneur has to believe that they're the one and they're put there for that purpose, whatever it is, and that it's worth following through. Because the moment you forget that, you're kind of lost on the journey. And in the end, I thought it was artfully done in The Matrix that uh, Neo, everybody else doubted him, including himself, and he was told he wasn't the one. And yet, he still did what had to be done. So that kind of shows that if you are really cut out for it, you'll end up doing it. Then there's nine, the ordeal. Uh, Oftentimes it is that once you seize the sword and once you've gotten that power, uh, you still have the ordeal. In the Matrix, that directly followed because that was kind of like the showdown uh, afterwards. But oftentimes, there's a combination of showdowns. And it's funny, it's also tantamount to business because it's one thing to invent a product. It's another thing to get it to market. Everybody remembers uh, Six Degrees, the first kind of social networking company. And then like the second one uh, with Friendster, and both of them kind of disappeared until you had MySpace come along and Facebook. And basically what happened, I mean, it's kind of an accident of time, but the advantage that MySpace had, well, first of all, they allowed you to make a page for your dog or anything like that. I read an article where he's talking that, remember going to Face, to Friendster and trying to make a page for his dog, and they, were take, they just took it down, and uh, one of the MySpace founders just thought that was like such a great thing. Because that gave them a huge opportunity to just kind of be more freewheeling. Also, they began in Los Angeles, and they let you put as many pictures as you wanted up. And they focused on the music entertainment. So that gave MySpace kind of that music indie feel to it, which totally lended this brand new value. The other one was invented more up in uh, San Francisco. So, and you're only allowed one picture, as opposed to multiple pictures and uh, video clips and all that. So MySpace totally took off running just with that small innovation. 
Uh, so that's the whole thing. You can have the ordeal and you can make the invention, you can get the patent, but then it's the whole idea of uh, getting to market, which is also known as the road on home, the road back. Because uh, once you cross over into the world, and Matrix like followed this almost to the T, you still have to make it on back. And of course, during his first ordeal, the fight with Agent Smith, uh, he ends up, he almost wins, but then he ends up getting shot, and he dies. But then there's the resurrection and the rescue from without. Uh, so is Trinity on the other side that kisses him because she still believes. And that resurrects him in it. And then for the first time, he sees, like, it's that famous part where the Matrix turns to all the streaming green numbers. He's able to defeat everything. Luke Skywalker, at the end of Star Wars, you'll remember, he's outnumbered and Darth Vader's closing in on him. And then all of a sudden, Han Solo returns because Han Solo comes back. So it's that classic rescue from without. That's what uh, Joseph Campbell called it. And in every classic Western after the showdown and after the bad guy's been killed, there's always one bad guy left somewhere who's looking out a window and aiming the gun at the good guy. And then one of the good guy's friends like shows up and shoots that last bad guy from various sides. Uh, and then there's, uh, in 10, there's the resurrection and the victory, or the resurrection and the showdown. And then finally, the last step is the road on home return with the elixir. So the road on back, of course, in Star Wars is that big ceremony that they have at the end. Oftentimes there's a ceremony or a wedding to tribute with it. Uh, in something like The Matrix, of course, it's all of them reuniting uh, back on the ship. And then in, an, in terms of a business, it's the exit strategy. And it's kind of it's interesting because they all tell you when you're writing a business plan, like don't even begin it until you have an exit strategy. Uh, so it's that whole idea that you have to have that same Aristotelian beginning, middle, and end uh, in the business world that you do in the uh, uh, in all the arts, too. And another thing, because uh, I call it artistic entrepreneurship, is kind of returning a certain perspective to entrepreneurship and also the true owners of entrepreneurship are the people who do the work, are the entrepreneurs. Because I think in recent times, that, that B. Joy and I talked about this a lot, that uh, in the venture capital world, a lot of times everything is focused on venture capital. And so the venture capitalists own everything. It's, it's kind of that myth that they create, that it's one person who founds, another person who owns. That classic thing is like the entrepreneurs often get detached and kicked out of their companies. But when you look at really successful companies, I mean, did they get rid of Bill Gates? No. Did they get rid of the Google founders? No. Did they get rid of Stephen Jobs? Yeah, they did, but they had to bring them back. So I think that's, by and large, a strange myth. Did they get rid of Richard Branson at Virgin? No. So then why did venture capitalists teach that entrepreneurs aren't suited to, like, taking companies? It's, it's been a strange thing. But you can almost map it. I love John Bogle's book, Battle for the Soul of Capitalism. Uh, he's in his 70s now, but he still pulls no punches throughout all the years. Uh, but in what he's talking about, it's just uh, how Wall Street's taken a turn for the wrong way. And you can see a lot of parallels with the way the venture capital is taught and the Wall Street machine is kind of like a quick buck. So it's kind of, it's fun bringing in like the whole idea of bootstrapping and more of like the rugged entrepreneur. And both Bogle and Warren Buffett are very much of the bootstrapping mentality uh, as opposed to uh, raising a lot of venture capital and taking something public that doesn't make any sense and making money that way. Uh, but anyway, so that's it in kind of a nutshell. And uh, thanks to B-Joy for inviting me. This has been so much fun. And it was fun talking to him last summer. Because uh, when you're doing uh, something that's a little bit new, a little bit different, it's always fun hearing people on parallel journeys. So any questions or anything? <laughs> I, I had one, actually. Uh, you, on this last one that you talked about on venture capital. Yeah. Um, so... It seems to me that like venture capital is like a way to try to avoid or to uh, blunt the uh, effects of the road of trial. You know, you, you get all this capital up front, and then you don't have to worry about the road of trials. You don't have to go through the pain. Um, you get the fancy office building and things like that. And uh, do, do you do you see some kind of parallel there? Because we're, we're trying, to, we're basically trying to skip a step or avoid the step of quote unquote pain that is part of this whole initiation stage, right, the world of trial stage in entrepreneurship. Oh, yeah. Well, I think, well, there's a time and place for everything. Yeah. But uh, speaking of the way that the business schools teach entrepreneurship, 
it's always you're writing a business plan for venture capitalists, which almost makes, it just always makes so little sense. They want like a five-year return of like $20 million kind of thing. Whereas you look at a place like Walmart, it didn't start off as somebody writing a vent, uh, pitch for venture capitalists, but it was like one store for 10 years. If you think about Starbucks, it was one coffee shop. So it's that whole idea of uh, starting small and ironing everything out and then growing uh, in a natural, organic manner. Uh, but yeah, I think that venture capital was, is, venture capital is more, I think, the popularity of it was more of a bygone era between like 1996 to 2000 or 2001, where the whole idea was to raise a lot of venture capital and take it public, and then all the insiders and everybody cashed out, and the company didn't exist, and the small investor was left holding the bag. Uh, I thank Bogle for putting this out, Buffett too, but Bogle especially in his book, that $7 billion was uh, not lost during the downturn after 2000, but it was transferred to all the people who like, sold high, which is usually like the venture capitalists and the insiders. So it's kind of like, I mean, that whole mentality of BC depends on kind of the ripping off like the little guy. Uh, I mean, the glory days of it. But that's not to say that after a company's been around for a while, definitely VC seems like a good way to go. But just, I mean, and you never hear anyone in the venture capital industry criticizing the $7 trillion gone. So it's just all a little bit, wait a second here, what really happened? But does that answer your question or not at all? Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have a follow-up question to that. So, like, in the hero's journey or Campbell's uh, writings, I mean, is refer to different figures that show up in the journey, you know, you know. Like the BC guys, do they have a position there? <laughs> uh, yeah, do they do they have a position or do they represent something in your journey? Oh, you mean the different people who show up? Yeah, the different people who show up. What else is, who are the BC guys? Yeah, well, that's uh, Joseph Campbell. That's another thing the class goes over. That in addition to writing the hero's journey, actually in the book, the hero's journey, he covers the archetypes, like just the different people that you'll meet along the way. And uh, looking right here, uh, well, for instance, there's like the Herald, like people who like give you the message. And here, I've got it. And uh, people like the shapeshifter. I mean, somebody who seems one thing and then they become another. So it's funny in this myth, what, what it kind of does is it opens your eyes to, this is just like the natural state of humanity and this is how uh, things unfold over time. Uh, so basically, if you're going to start a business, you're going to meet generally all these archetypes. And know that anybody, I mean, just in the workplace, you run across all different types of people. Uh, does that answer your question? Sure, journey, I mean, I guess I'm thinking of one idea or one product. Do you have several journeys in your lifetime, or is that all part of one big journey? Oh, wait, some of that broke up. Could you ask that again? Talk about hero's journeys and entrepreneurship. I usually think of one idea and think of one business. But in fact, you could have several of those. If one doesn't work out and you move to the next one, or if it does work out and you move to the next one. Do you have several journeys in your lifetime, or is it all part of one big journey that you're in? Oh, definitely. You can definitely break it up into uh, individual smaller journeys. But just like uh, The Lord of the Rings was split up into three different movies, and they all had their beginning, middle, and end. Same thing with all the Star Wars and every Harry Potter. Because they all end with like a big battle and a big showdown and everything. But then there's the overarching journey of getting the ring the whole way across. Uh, so definitely, uh, you can look at it as hero's journeys within hero's journeys of the different chapters. Same thing with the Harry Potter uh, I think there's like seven books, and they're all going to be that way. Uh, always kind of going towards the same eventual destination. But it's fun, too, because uh, that's another thing that entrepreneurship is as much the domain as kind of like a liberal arts education as it is a business education. And it's kind of fun because when you start reading uh, like Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and things like that, uh, I mean, there's as much need for accounting as there is for kind of like philosophy and mythology. And even Adam Smith, uh, one of the preeminent economists, he wrote, I mean, he is primarily a philosopher before an economist. So it's the whole idea that uh, the economics of something ought to be rooted in mythology and story, too. I uh, don't know if it's a question more than an observation of... of uh Something you said, which really uh, struck me, was um, I don't remember in, in the hero with a thousand faces. 
uh, Campbell talking about this idea of you know failure, uh, competitive failures, you know, kind of iterating until you finally uh, get out of failures. Um, that was something you mentioned that I thought was really interesting. It made me think of um, uh, Groundhog Day, the movie. It made me think of Charlie Brown, um, and it made me think of uh, uh, stand-up comedians where they go uh, 10 years uh, trying to get their material to find their material. Oh, yeah, definitely. And like Thomas Edison, who said that he didn't fail a thousand times, but he succeeded once in trying to get the right filament for the light bulb, is that they're all just steps along the greater journey. Uh but yeah, that's time and time again that failing is a process of learning, if you can view it that way. That, I mean, if you've got big dreams, you're definitely going to run up against a lot of hurdles along the way. Uh, but it's fun, like the whole idea of like forming a fellowship and uh, the different people that you meet along the way and things like that. And there's also like, there's somewhat of a deeper significance too that uh, all the mythologies carry, and that's that the heroes are generally people who serve. Uh, they're not the ones who exist, and that, that goes back to the same fundamental moral premise of both Vanguard and the movie Braveheart, that the heroes are the ones who serve the people as opposed to the ones that uh, exploit or capitalize on human fallacies and things like that. So that that kind of puts entrepreneurship in kind of a nobler light, too, that it's not so much about making money as it is creating wealth. And if you create wealth, then the money generally follows. It's interesting when you talk about a moral premise, like Google for their company slogan uh, has a moral premise, do no evil. So they they have it at that. I can't think of any other company slogans that kind of like have that moral premise in it uh, offhand. But I'm sure a lot do uh, in an intrinsic way. That the trials and tribulations of the is really an issue really focused on who you're being, right? Like it gets rid of all the falsehoods and the uh, belief systems and, <laughs> you know, because you, you're, you're living a world of results. And so just whatever you believe or you think or you feel don't matter, it results. And it really, over time, boils down to really who you're being. And I think that that is, that's the part of the journey. Really, that's like the, the end goal of the journey getting rid of all these other extraneous systems that don't work for you and really get down to who you really are. I think that's so true, and that's like the deeper thing of entrepreneurship, that if you can find some way to make your passion your profession, then that's really when you end up winning. Because uh, money is such a kind of external, extrinsic way of defining success. Uh, that's what, I mean, you tell students, like, who created more wealth? Uh, we were just talking about the YouTube deal. That sold for 1.7 billion, and but who created more wealth? Them or like a writer? Because when you look at the three uh, JRO, JRR token movies, each one did about a billion dollars. So the total is about three billion dollars uh, in ticket sales, and that's just the movies, and that's discounting all the millions of books sold, in the video games and all the other things that have gone around the Hobbit. And plus, the Hobbit's still going to get made. So when you start talking about the true notion of wealth. And plus, YouTube, by and large, a lot of it, uh, it's wealth. I mean, people viewing, it's like other people's content stuff. There's a lot of gray areas there. So it's kind of that whole idea, which is more valuable, technology or poetry. Well, we live in a day and age where definitely the technology kind of gets the front and center. But uh, Epic Myth, uh, it's a funny thing, because if you took Epic Myth, like you took Lord of the Rings to Wall Street on any given day, like what's the value of that, you know? Like how much are those three books worth? So if you ask an MBA to evaluate the price of that, it'd be difficult. But uh, that's the something about entrepreneurship, that it really, at the end of the day, you do have to define what success and wealth mean to you and then follow that. And there's a freedom that comes with that. Uh, and also it's kind of, in studying myth, it kind of gives you the courage to go off and do it on your own. Because not only do you read like Lord of the Rings, but then you also get interested in the person behind it. And so often it is that all works of myth are somewhat of parallel to the people's lives. Even Joseph Campbell, uh, he didn't get a Ph.D. because he didn't want to fill out all the forms and stuff. Instead, during the Great Depression, he went and lived in the woods for five years. And it was something he was living in a cabin around Woodstock. I think it was like $20 a year for the cabin. I don't know if you get such a good deal these days. 
But uh, basically, he kind of lived the hero's journey because he took the road less traveled and followed his bliss and just read books for like five years. But then he was never really, he didn't really get that great of an academic position. He's never taken seriously in the realm of academia. But that's kind of like the risk and the gamble that you take. And so often it is that if you hear that call to adventure and you follow it, uh, then you, that whole refusal to call, a lot of people say, well, that's not really worth anything. That's not worth it. So it, it really gets, the fun thing about the class is so much, so many times school is taught, that teaches you this is good, this is bad, this is how you should live, this is what you should do, this is what you should know. And this class begins with a different premise. It says, what do you want to do? And the students quickly recognize that the people who have the passion are the ones who are doing better. And it's got nothing to do with how much you've memorized or how smart you are so much as do you really like what you're doing? Uh, and it tells them that kind of, because I think that's the way life in the bigger picture ends up working. But yeah, are there any other questions? I wish I could join all you guys down there. You'll have to come and visit Austin, and we'll, we'll have to have you do a talk in person, too. Oh, well, yeah. Actually, next semester, I'm still getting the details together, but I'm having a Hero's Journey Entrepreneurship Conference on March 31st, most likely. It'll be a Saturday out here at Pepperdine University in Malibu. Uh, so if anybody's at all interested, and I'm trying to make it a most useful day, uh, the morning sessions will be devoted to kind of uh, different people teaching artistic entrepreneurship, kind of presenting that. But the whole theme of the day is the hero's journey throughout all. And then the rest of the day, we, we're getting a lot of speakers in kind of the Hollywood industry, which is a good place to do the hero's journey and entrepreneurship uh, lined up. We already have some guys who uh, work with Chronicles of Riddick video games and Universal Vivendi, and just uh, different people who are interested in storytelling. And one of the themes is uh, a lot of these people have written books about their industry. So we have three different people lined up so far who've written books about what they do. Uh, so that's kind of, that'll be fun. Uh, but definitely, if you guys want to join us, that'd be fun. Uh, what, are, what are other people doing there? Bootstrapping. <laughs> Bootstrapping, yes. That's a great thing. Yeah, we were talking that I, I've done Jolly Rogers since 1995 and never got any angel investing or raised any money, but just always kept it on a bootstrap kind of uh, thing. And I, I mean, I started it in 95 before they even had banner ads, uh, and then they had banner ads. I saw some in 97, so I just called the place and put them on the site, and that's kind of how it started. And then it, then it was uh, so it's that whole idea that if you follow your bliss, it leads to good things. I was talking earlier, too, about solving a small problem for yourself. Have you guys heard of pbase.com, like the photo hosting site? It's, one, it's in the top 500 of all websites in the world, but uh, the guy lives in Chapel Hill who started it, and he just didn't like the other web hosting sites because they all had advertising next to, like, the photos. And to him, photography is really much, very much an art. So he started pbase, and basically now he's got one of the strongest brands for very highly artistic photography because he never, ever put banner ads. And I remember the month that he received like a $5,000 bandwidth bill all of a sudden because he was just posting like paying like $1,500 a month, but it got so popular that he got nailed with a $5,000 bandwidth bill. So he didn't want to charge, but he had to. So he decided to start charging like $23 because that's his favorite prime number for a year's account. And today it still costs $23 for a year for the basic account. But he started making money hand over fist when he did that. Uh, and he never even wanted to charge money, so that was the funny thing. But it's the whole idea of somebody who's just following their bliss and just doing something, and then they get hit with a big bill, so then they charge money, and then uh, starts getting paid. So it's, it's fun. Sarah Blakely, I, had, uh, I knew one of her friends really well, but I also love the story of Spanx but with Panty has. Has anyone heard of Spanx? Yeah, we were saying that we, that we have. Some of us have. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. But, but yeah, and I have the opportunity uh, to do kind of like a book that's based on the hero's journey in entrepreneurship. Then I'm trying to do two things with it, and one is to provide like the most useful resources. So basically, uh, I mean, as long as you're going along the hero's journey, it's also directing you to like the United States Copyright Office, like all the useful pages for like the startup entrepreneur and all the most useful websites. So it's that whole idea of kind of like meeting the mentor and getting the right tools, because that's like a huge part, like Luke Skywalker's training or uh, Neo's training, or even Frodo, like 
speak with Gandalf and getting mentorship across the whole way. So it's kind of fun bringing all that in. And then also putting in perspective, like some of the trials that you might face, and that whole idea of calling the bluff whenever you're doing uh, any deal. Because so many deals these days, I mean, if you look transparently, I mean, if you're in a band or anything like that, you're signing a record deal, the purpose of the deal is to transfer all the risk to you and all the wealth to the record label, or as much as possible. Exact same thing on Wall Street. Like, I mean, basically, I mean, Mark Cuban's written a lot about this and John Bogle, that when you give your money to somebody, a mutual fund, what they're doing, in effect, is you're, do, you're putting all your money up for risk. Cause, I mean, stocks can go down to zero, but they're making the commissions and they're making all of the money in the turnover and things like that. So they're getting all the reward. So one thing to keep in mind as an entrepreneur is that the risk taker ought to always get the reward. And that's kind of a little bit like just how there's like a central moral premise of Braveheart in movies. Uh, that's kind of like the moral premise of the book, that you as the risk taker ought to reap the maximum rewards. Uh, BJ and I were talking, there's a great movie uh, called For a Fistful of Dollars, uh, and it's based on a Japanese movie, actually. And the movie was directed by Sergio Leone, an Italian director, and it was the movie that kind of launched Clint Eastwood in international stardom as the man with no name. So the movie is directed by an Italian director based on a Japanese movie, and yet it's a Western set in the Old West. So it's kind of like just crosses all the cultures on that level. But there's a great part in it where after Clint Eastwood kind of early on, he shoots one of the gangsters, of the rival gangsters, and uh, so then he wants payment. And then he's eavesdropping on this conversation between two of the gangsters, but he doesn't hear it. Uh, but, I mean, but they don't know that he's listening. And one of them goes, well, instead of paying him, why don't we just shoot him? I think that's a huge part of a lot of business transactions that you see throughout a lot of different things. Like, instead of paying the entrepreneur, instead of paying the band, why don't we just get rid of them, right? Why don't we just not pay them? So that's the way that a lot of uh, contracts, I think, over time were structured. And Van Halen had that famous quote. Like, we've been on tour for a year for their first album, and we sold, like, 10 million records, and we're a million dollars in debt. Uh, and Courtney Love has this thing that she's talking about, uh, she doesn't like piracy, and that means taking people's profits from them. And then she's calling it the record labels like the biggest pirates. Of course, in this day and age, the Internet is allowing the circumvention of a lot of those older modes, but people are still trying to figure out how to maximally, how to maximize that. Uh, and Because we've also run into like the thing of a lot of Web 2.0 companies don't necessarily pay the content creators that much, and yet they end up making a lot, a lot of money. Because still, it's difficult to make a living, even if you're really popular on MySpace, because basically you're not getting revenue from all the ads sold in MySpace. It's the same thing as like Flickr and most Web 2.0 companies. So, I mean, but that's an opportunity for other systems to rise that give the reward to the risk taker. And I think that that's a fun kind of call to adventure, is kind of how can we build the best systems that actually give uh, the rewards to the risk takers. So uh, that's that's kind of a challenge. I think like Web 3.0 and 4.0 and things like that are going to concentrate more and more on that. Because you come with a social networking system that actually pays the creators more and gives them more incentive to create, I think you'll get uh, better content and you'll get people gravitating towards that. But what that will look like uh, is yet to be seen. Does anybody have a Zoom yet? A what? A Zoom, the Microsoft Zoom. Oh, the zoo? No, no. Yeah. No, yeah, it's, uh, I, I just been reading, like, that it, it hasn't been quite as good as iPod. Yep. It fell off the, uh, Amazon top ten list pretty quickly, so. Yeah, doesn't the iPod, like, take up all ten of the top ten or something like that? Yeah, they're, like, they've got seven of the top ten. They're all the yeah. Ten. That, that's what I, yeah, I heard that the iPod, uh, charger was out selling the Microsoft Zune. Yeah, <laughs> Well, Elliot, um, thanks so much for, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. It's like so much fun. I, I wish I could have joined you guys. Thanks for listening to Boot Wrap. I'm Brian Massey with HearThis.com. This content is copyright 2006, Bootstrap Network, all rights reserved. Our thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for our theme music. 